I'm going to talk to you um, today about the magic of analysis. And I would like to start with a bit of an example. Um, and I'm hoping that you guys here could help me out. Is that okay? Perfect. Thank you very much. Now, I've got in my pocket what some of you might know as... Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I was taught microphone technique from a very young age, um, and you're meant to hurl it here, but that's okay. I shall do some bad microphone technique. Um, what I've got here is a pack of playing cards. Some of you may know them as. But for my example today, this is not a pack of playing cards. It's a pack of data packets. Okay? It is a pack of unique data packets which we can transfer through our network, which we have here, of people. Okay. So it's going to work a little bit like this. Um, I'm wondering if you could just be my microphone stand. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Perfect. Um, this is a pack of data packets. Um, I'm just going to get you to confirm that they're driven data packets. Yes, they are. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do is, I'll turn it back a second. We're going to, um, I'm going to get you to, well, I'll get someone to pick one. You can continue to be my microphone stand. I'm going to get someone to pick one of these data packets out at random. And then you're going to look at it. Remember it, I want you then just hurl it against your chest, okay? And um, then you're going to transfer that packet down the network we've got here. Okay, for me? So this is how it's going to work. Can you continue to be my microphone send? This is how it's going to work. Okay. <laughs> you're just going to randomly pick one of those. Yep, look at it, remember it. Okay, you don't need to show me it, that's fine. Okay. Now, we're just going to form a little network for you to transfer that packet over. So, uh, uh, would, would you mind just placing your hand on his head? Perfect. Beautiful. And if you could do the same, and the same again, and then finally the same again. Okay. You're now just, by using the power of your mind, you're going to think about that card, you're going to transfer a message all the way through our network, and then using my inbuilt protocol analyzer, I am going to... L listen to your signals, and I'm going to tell you what card you have. Okay? So, so first of all, we'll, we'll, we'll be easy, okay? I just want the color. Just think about the color of the card and send that message. Okay. Here we go. I'm, I, I'm getting a, a red card, okay? So I think it's red. So if it's red, it can either be a diamond or a heart. So now I just want you to think about a diamond and heart. Okay. Or oh, a girl's best friend. I think it's diamonds. Yeah, I know what you were thinking. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, now, uh, now it's either going to be a value from 1 to 10, or it's going to be a jack, queen, or king. I just want you to think what the value is on the card. Okay. And some of you might get the message as it comes down the aisle, yeah? So you feel it too? Good. Okay. Okay. I'm getting... It's not, it's not a high number, is it? It's... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for the four of diamonds. Is it the four of diamonds? It's the four of diamonds. Look at that. Now... I wanted to say my talk like that because I wanted to talk about um, the concept of um, analysis and how if you use analysis properly, it can be a little bit like being a magician. Okay, so I think if you've got a protocol analyzer and you use it correctly, it can very much be like um, your magic wand in your toolkit. I often get called out to troubleshoot driven networks. It's something I spend quite a bit of my time doing as a consultant. Um, but people phone me up when they've got a problem in the wireless network. They don't phone me up the first time there's a problem. They always try and fix it themselves first. Um, and generally, when they phone me up, they've often had a problem for one month, two months, three months, sometimes even six months to a year. And it's been a problem for a while, and they can't fix it. So then I go in, and within 24 hours, I tell them what the problem is. How? How do I manage to seemingly go in there like a magician 
get my little tools out, come up with a solution to a problem they've had for six months. Um, it's all about using the right tools and having a visibility which for a lot of the time other people don't have. Um, and, and being able to look at the problem it, from a different point of view. Um, so it's not just having the tools, it's also knowing how to use it. Now, what I want to do today is I want to try and... I'm, I'm not going to teach you all how to be protocol a a analysts um, in an hour talk. But what I want to do is I want to make you um, consider using protocol analyzers more. I want to try and um, make you realize just what a powerful tool it is and enable you to be the magician too. Okay? So, but you've got, to, um, you've got to put some work in to get to that stage. Okay? But I want to talk to you about analyzers, why they're so good, and, and why I think that it's such an important part of anyone's toolkit. So first of all, let's talk about sort of the power and limitation of a protocol analyzer. Um, the, w w the, the power of an analyzer, I always say this, is that the packets never lie. It lets you see exactly what's happening on your network. Not what you think is happening on your network. You know, you, you might think, well, I, I know how I've, what I've configured it to do, and I, I, I know what I, I believe it's doing, but what's actually really happening on your network? Well, the only way you can get that view is by actually looking at the packets. So we... Um, and, and they actually let you see what's happening. I guess the limitation of an analyzer is that if you're trying to find a problem that's not manifested in the packets, it's not going to show you it. So, and it's why, um, if you're going to do analysis, a spectrum an analyzer is also a very key tool of anyone's analysis toolkit. You want a spectrum analyzer for looking at layer one, two and above, generally a protocol analyzer. Um, but even when the problem isn't manifested in the packets, sometimes a lack of packets tells you there's a problem on your network. Sometimes it's a very fact that there's no packets there and it's not sending the packets I think it should be sending can indicate where the problems are occurring. So you, you've got a powerful tool there if we just know how to use it. Um, it gives us a view of the network where we actually can see what's really happening on the network. Now the screenshot um, that you can see on the screen now was from a consultancy job I did a, a while back where it was a retail store um, and all the point of sale terminals, all, all the, the, their tills had stopped working. They started getting timeouts between them. Um, they, they, they basically was, couldn't contact the server and they were trying to process payments and it, the connections were timing out. They had to shut the store for three days. They first phoned me and said, we need you on site. And I was like, sorry, I'm in Edinburgh. Um, but they, by the time I went on site, three days after this problem, and the store had been shut for three days, I walked in to see these network engineers, frantic, sweaty. Um, they had just replaced the Cisco switch. They were now re-pulling um, fiber cables because, you know, that'll fix the problem, won't it? Um, but with no view of the network, I, I saw on the, I wonder this, they had an, um, a, a fluke omniscope on the, on the table. I went, oh, you've got a fluke omniscope. I went, yeah, we don't know how to use it. It was. It's brilliant. I, I spent probably two hours at that store. Um, I, I, I took a capture of one of their main um, switches, and I saw pretty much what you can see on the screen. I saw the tills, which should be talking to the server you see at the top there, talking to each other. And this is just a snapshot in time, actually, I'm sure, on the screen. They're actually taking it in turns to contact each other. And all the time. And I said, should your point of sales terminals be talking to each other? And as we got back, I oh, we don't know. I said, I, I don't think they should be. Um, and so we sent someone to a nearby store just to do another capture to check if that was happening in every store, and it wasn't. Um, I, I looked up the port that was being used, and... Um, it was a port that's commonly used by a Trojan to do denial of service attacks. And what you effectively had was the tills performing denial of service attacks against each other. And then I, they started rebuilding all those point of sales terminals. I said goodbye and walked away and left them rebuilding all their point of sales terminals through the night. It probably took them all night to complete. Um, so... I got that visibility for a three-day-old problem, which nobody could see, just because I hadn't looked at what's actually happening on the network. So when should we capture, and, and what should we use sort of analyzers for? Well, 
I've put it down into sort of four main areas, I think, for when we should capture. One, troubleshooting, which I've talked about, which I'm passionate about. I love troubleshooting. Um, but I, I believe within that, you shouldn't always just use a, a, a network analyzer as a last resort. If you read troubleshooting documents and books um, and methodologies, they'll often go, first thing you do is you, you, know, you go through this procedure, you check the logs, check your configuration, then maybe check network management systems, and you go through this whole procedure. And then if you really can fix the problem, then get a protocol analyzer out. You know what I say? If the protocol analyzer is the last resort that's going to fix your problem, why not start with it? Save yourself all that time in the first place. Um, people don't do it. I think it's sometimes because people are scared of it as a tool. Um, but it, it really can save you a lot of time by just pulling it out and seeing what's happening. Um, the other thing I think you can do with protocol analysis is you can get performance analysis stats out of it. You know, how much, what's the channel utilization like, number of free tries per AP, per client, what are, what's our per channel interference, how many APs are operating on a certain channel. Just a general performance of your wireless network. Is a, so it's not always a troubleshooting tool. Sometimes it's to just look at the performance of the wireless environment, and that's a, another valid use case. But also baseline in your network. If you're going to ever come to troubleshoot a network, you can follow lots and lots of dead-end leads. You can begin, oh, now that's really interesting. We've got 20% retries there, but is that normal for your environment? If you've not baselined your RF environment, how do you know what's normal? And it's much quicker and easier to troubleshoot if you have an idea of what normal looks like than when a problem occurs, you're looking for what's different between the two. So I, I'd really encourage baselining RF environments. Um, and, and just using analyzers, the more you use analyzers, the more you learn what, how protocols work and how things operate. Um, but educate, for your own education as well. If you want to learn how Wi-Fi works, and I mean really work, capture some packets, look at the protocol. Because then you can actually understand how it works. If you're trying to understand something, set a lab up, get an analyzer out, capture it. The amount of times it actually, you actually go, oh, that's really how it works, is it? Um, so use it as an educational tool as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit through a, a methodology. I don't want to spend too long on methodology, but just a, a talk a little bit about some tips I would have on troubleshooting methodology. Um, and the first one, big thing I always say, is when you're troubleshooting a problem, start off by making no assumptions. Assume nothing. Because people will tell you what they believe the problem is, they will tell you what they want you to look at and where the problems are occurring. Everybody loves to tell you what the issue is before you've done any troubleshooting. I can normally guarantee that the issue that the customer tells me is not the issue of the network. Do you know why? Because if they knew what the issue is, they wouldn't be getting me into troubleshooting. And probably the reason they haven't been able to solve it is because they've been fixated that this issue is a certain thing. And then you realize it isn't in the final place. And you see that time and time and time again, that people are fixated that there's a particular issue. Um, we had that once with uh, some troubleshooting I was doing for an estate agent where they had, um, they had four sites um, around um, the UK. Um, one of those sites was very near to where I live in a town called Hull. Hull's a bit different. It's the only place in the UK you can get a BT telephone line. And there's a company called Kingston. So they had... Um, a, a driven ID, um, ADSL connection at this one site. And they were getting problems on their voice, that every time they made more than three voice calls, the people who were on the phone couldn't hear them. So they went, it must be the ADSL connection. That's the only thing that's driven to all the sites. And they got me in basically to prove a three-month argument they were having with the telecoms provider that there was a problem. Of course, it was nothing to do with the telecoms line. It was to do with their router they had on site was actually had some band limiting turned on. But if I'd gone in just to look at the, that Teddy cell connection, I wouldn't have seen a problem. I went in there with an open mind to analyze and see the problem and to figure it out. You need to be able to observe the problem happening. So if someone says, the Wi-Fi's not working, our users keep getting kicked off the Wi-Fi. Oh, okay. Yeah, periodically they get kicked off the Wi-Fi. We don't know why. What do you think? Maybe an interference source. It could be something like that. 
But then you go and you talk to the users, and you go, so you've been kicked off the Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, what, what happens? So you know your wireless signal strength? You ever see it drop off? Oh, no, it's always full, but I can't browse the web. It might actually be nothing to do with the Wi-Fi. It's actually to do with the back-end firewall that keeps going up and down or something like that. But a, so the perception of what they see the problem for yourself and observe it and actually capture the packets when you're doing it. Now, sometimes that's not easy. Um, I, I did a big... Um, there's a problem at a massive retailer. It's probably my favorite wireless problem to tell people about because I've never seen anything so devastating um, to a wireless network. But they, 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 it was a big warehouse um, distribution center. They had about 600 handheld mobile devices doing picking operations. And they just brought 200 new ones. They were Vocalect T5s, if anyone knows what they are. They're, they're voice pickers. And they were turning them on. And it, just in the charging pods not being used, they got to about 90, turned on and associated to the network, and the entire network came to a standstill. I mean, it, the entire network came to a standstill. So I went in to troubleshoot it, and I said, OK, can we turn some of these devices on? Let's see. No, you can't do that. Do you know how much a minute it costs us if our distribution center stops? And I said, well, we, 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 we won't turn them on again until we know the problem, what the problem is, and that is fixed. I said, I can't troubleshoot an issue I can't see. So that led to an entire day of a phone conversation, me getting agreement to actually reintroduce the problem so I could troubleshoot it, which we did. And it was an incredible um, sight to see when you've got a busy warehouse and things go zoom, zoom, moving about, picking, and then you turn these devices on and slowly it just grinds to a standstill. No one's moving. Everyone's looking, so all waiting for where to go next, what item to pick and they're not getting anything. It's an incredible sight to see. Um, but again, I had to see it. And when we, you're doing that sort of troubleshooting work, it's a bit like real detective work. You're going to be looking at captures. I had a capture at that time on the wired network. I had a general wireless capture, and I was following a client around as they were turning devices on. Um, and then you've got to look through all of that data, and you've got to try and pick out what's unusual. Is there any suspicious protocols? Is there any suspicious... Um, Nodes, is my top talker someone I don't expect it to be? Why is it Bob sat over there? You know, what's he doing? So you're looking for anything un un unnormal. Is the operations which should be working, which aren't? And you, you, you start to think, you know, what, where am I actually going to analyze it? And, and how am I going to get to the bottom of it? So you, 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 to look for what's unnormal, you need to know what normal is. Um, and I mentioned baselining, but it, at the end of the day, it's really coming down to knowing your protocol. It's so important that you guys learn how protocol works, how it should operate, what's normal. Um, just out of interest, how, how many people here have got their CWAP? Great. Um, CWAP, I, I obviously recommend the Cybex study guide, um, written by some good authors. Um, <laughs> I strongly recommend that book. Um, but, but do get a book like that. Do read it. Do learn the protocol because otherwise what you see on your analyzer is pointless if you don't know how things operate. Um, the problem in the warehouse I was talking about was all down to a DTIM. Um, well, well, there was a several issues, but one of the main fixes was modifying the DTIM interval. Now, if you don't know what the DTIM interval is, again, read my book. Um, but... Um, it's a, it, 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 it's, a, it's a new one, sort of power save, and it's how often clients need to wake up. And it, and it, it ultimately caused its entire warehouse to come to a standstill. So, let's just talk about knowing our protocol then. Just a bit of an example, just so we can um, help maybe visualize what I'm talking about. Troubleshooting... Um, 802.1x authentication. Um, often it's a common, if people can't connect, there's often some issue with the 802.1x communication. Um, I love to look at problems both from the wireless and the wired side because it gives me the full picture. Um, don't always just think capturing on the wireless side gives you everything you need to know. Um, and I've got um, a couple of slides with problems at two different points. How can I identify what those problems are? Well, because I know my protocol. So if we look at this first one, this is the wireless capture here, and we've got the wired capture here. We can see that the client successfully authentic 
the case, open system authentication, they successfully associate to the AP with an association request and response. So then they do an ePulse start. They start a 802.1x authentication. We see some requests, some responses, and a failure. So why did it fail? Well, there's lots of things I know just from knowing my protocol. I know that there was communication even before I look at my wire trace follow with the radiate server because a neat failure comes back from the authentication server. So I know my, my infrastructure is configured right to talk to a radiate server. I know we've got that sort of configuration happening right. There's been several requests and responses. So I know the fact that we've got a response, that means a response coming back from the radiate server. And I know we send something back in response to that. When I look on the wired side, I can the wired side. Sorry, I can see the requests, a challenge coming back, and then a username, and then I can actually see we get a reject message. What's happening is their credentials have been rejected. They are failing authentication, so they're probably putting the wrong username or password. In this respect, it's it's that they've not got the correct credentials, and it's a and it's a valid thing to fail because they're putting the wrong credentials onto the network. It's a little bit different to this one. Um, here we've got, again, successful open system authentication, association, and then we start the 802.1x process, ePulse start, we get a request, we have a response, the request comes from the wireless AP, response from the client, and there's nothing else. So where's that going wrong? Well, I know that the first thing that happens is that first request is the AP says, who are you? What's your username? Then I return my username, and then it passes that onto a radio server to say, can this user connect? But then a radio server should send me back another challenge. It's not happening. So, where, so the problem could be that the AP is not sending it onto the radio server. It could be the radio server not responding. The radio server might be down. That's why having a wired capture is really helpful. Because in the wired capture, I see the AP sent to the radio server the request, but there's no response. So I now know the, the, the radiate server isn't responding. I've got a place to look, haven't I? The radiate server, why is it not responding? Is it up? Is it operating? Is it doing what we call a silence disconnect, which it can do if the, it hasn't got the NAS ID of the AP or the controller in, built into it? But it gives me a place to look. Because I know what's normal, I can look at this protocol. I can say, this is where you're going wrong. This is where I next need to know. So knowing your protocol is incredibly important because you can look at something and you go, okay, I now know where to look next. It might not always tell you the exact problem, but it'll tell you where it's failing. <clears throat> as well as knowing your protocol, know how different vendors behave and the nuances between them. Don't assume everyone's the same. If you've troubleshoot a Cisco wireless network, don't expect it to be the same with an Aruba network. Um, this is just an example of the, in my analyzer, it says a WMM information element, 221, 221. Um, this one, I can see all the access categories of WMM defined, telling the client what it would need to do. And here, there isn't any. So if I'm troubleshooting a problem with my voice, I might go, oh, well, the problem is you're not telling the client how to specify its voice packets. That's why the network's not working. I could come to that conclusion. Actually, did you know that this first one's actually a, what the standard calls a WMM parameter element, and this is a WM information element? They look the same, they've got the same ID, but they, this one contains parameters, this one doesn't. And do you know what the standard says about us? It says that every beacon frame will transmit a WM enabled AP shall contain, in addition to those elements, either an information element or a WM parameter element. So it can contain either or. And if it doesn't have these credentials in the beacon, it then will, it has to have it in the probe response frame. So we're still informing them, it's just that information is in a different frame. And Zebra took it out of the beacon to try and make the beacon frame smaller, or chose that way of doing it. So it's not wrong, it just does it in a different way. And we need to understand these differences if we're gonna troubleshoot correctly, so we're not again going down blind alleys. So, can I just read the standard? Why, if I'm going to learn, you say you've got to use an analyzer to learn protocol, why not just read the standard? The problem is two things. Vendors don't always follow the standard. 
<gasps> Revelation. They don't. They don't always follow the standard. They do things in proprietary ways. They're also, the standard is open to interpretation. The standard doesn't always say you've got to do it exactly like this. You can read something in a standard, and it can be interpreted in different ways, and therefore be interpreted by different chips, set manufacturers and different vendors in different ways. So how do we know what's happening? We've got to capture. And we've got to have a look at what actually happens. I want to just show you an example. It's one some of you will know, but just an example of what I mean by this, by talking about power save. The 802.11 standard, the original standard, defined how power save should work, and it should work like this. We've got a client station. It is in power save mode, which means it's nice having a nice little sleep. I wanted a bit of a power save um, halfway through the day yesterday, um, but I didn't get it. Um, so it's having a sleep. Um, and, and what they do when they're in power save mode, they wake up to listen to beacon frames from the AP, which we have over here. So it's waking up to listen to a beacon frame, and the beacon will tell that client if it's got any frames buffered for it, because obviously it's been buffering frames while it's been asleep. If it says in its beacon it's got frames buffered, the AP knows to stay awake, and it sends a little frame called a power save Perl frame, which is acknowledged by the AP. And then it sends a d the data it's got buffered for it. And if it's got the more data bit, which is a little bit inside the frame set to one, it means I've got more data, stay awake, you can't go to sleep again just yet. So then I act the data of my client, send another power save Perl, get an act back, get my data, get an act back. That is how. Power save is meant to work. Once I have a no data bit, I can then go back to sleep. That's how the standard defines it. Do you know very, very few people implement it like that? In fact, virtually nobody implements it like that. Because actually, to transmit two data frames, there's quite a lot of overhead there, isn't there? And vendors look at it and go, it's a little bit of a lot of overhead. You know, we don't want to do that. Do you, do you want to see what vendors do? Let me show you. As opposed to just looking at slides all the time, let me show you. Here's, um, I, I'm just going to, I use OmniPeak over analyzers that are available. Um, this is just a capture um, I, I started before I started speaking um, of Channel 11. So it's live in the environment. I've not looked at it, but we're just going to see clients doing power save in this room. Um, and I'm going to do that very quickly by going to the protocols tab. And I'm just going to pick out these null data packets. You, you'll see it says null. Um, there's quas null, or there's a few more actual just non-null data frames. So what we're going to do is I'm going to right-click on there, and I'm going to select all those packets, and I'm going to copy them to a new window. All that does is literally pull out all my null data packets and put them in a separate window, which we have there. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick one of the clients that I can see, because um, I just want to see them from a particular client. I'm doing this completely at random. I'm going to select a client. I'm going to say by source. And I'm again going to copy to a new window. I now have all the null data packets coming from one particular device. Do you ever wonder, do you, if you do uh, analysis, why is there so many null data frames in the air? If you notice on my protocol tab, it's about my fifth highest protocol. Um, and this client is certainly sending a lot. So let's have a look why he's sending a lot. Um, he's sending a lot because this is how clients do power save. There's a little bit in the Mac header. It doesn't have any data to send, so it's why it's a null data frame. And it's called the power management bit. When it's one, it says, I'm in power save mode. Tells the AP it's got to buffer traffic for it. When it's set to zero, it says, I'm awake. You can send me data. So what we do, instead of... Um, instead of sort of staying in power save mode and doing its PS data, we flip the power management bit on and off. When we want to go to sleep, we set it to one like this. If I just go to the very next packet, it might be easier to see if I don't put the blue on it, actually. You'll see power management set to zero. If I go to the next packet, power management set to one. If I go to the next packet, power management set to zero. This is how power save works in the real world. Instead of doing all that power save, we just flip our power management bits. We say we're in power save mode, buffer traffic. We still wake up to listen to beacons, but we just flip our power management bit to 
zero, and the API goes, oh, you're not in power save mode anymore, deliver frames normally, data rack, data rack, data rack, and then you flip it again, I'm in power save, so I'm buffering frames again. So that's how it really works. You very, very rarely see a power save Perl frame in your captures. I have captured live power save Perl frames, I'm always quite excited when I do. It's just the sort of guy I am. Um, but um, you don't often see them. It's like catching a rare um, Pokemon. Uh, oh, um, Pokemon, sorry, not Pokemon. Um, that's a driven game, yeah. Yeah, Pika Pokemon game, I don't know. Um, so, So just in case you get the slides up to the talk, um, I know I did that in um, OmniPeak, but I've just put an example of rail power save as it's implemented on the slide as well. So you've got that as a reference, because I know it's quite useful. Um, this next slide, before I put it up. So I get excited by rare packets in the air. OK. I, uh, and, and, and this one, this, this really blew me away when I saw this next packet. In fact, I got quite excited by it which might make me quite sad, but I did. Um, and, and maybe for some people in the room, I, I actually first um, showed it slide um, at the Wi-Fi track conference a, a year ago in California, and Dave Coleman, some of you know Dave Coleman, was sat at the end of the room. He actually stood up and went, that's just blown me away, man! <laughs> so if you want to see what blows Dave Coleman away, um, it's this next slide. Um, Have I built it up enough yet? <laughs> Here it is. And you all get what? So let me explain what you see here. This was, when I saw this, I was just like, what on earth is going on here? The reason it was, there's one frame there which really surprised me. And it's this one right at the end. It says CFN, CFE. C, it says contention free end frame. It was defined as part of the PCF standard. PCF is something that no one implements, and there's people like myself, like Keith, who have worked tirelessly to make sure it's not in any of the CWNA material because it's not implemented, it's not real world. Why do you need to learn it? And then I'm doing its capture, and normally when you see them in your captures, they're corrupted frames. They've got a little CRC error next to them. And I saw it, and I went, there's a lot of those. There's not my corruption flag here. Is this rail? It was rail. And I was seeing its pattern. RTX, CTX, some encrypted data, ACK, CFN frame. And I was like, that is odd. And then I said, and I've seen this now lots of times, lots of times based around its Intel Citrino chipset. This Intel Citrino chipset is an 802.11n chipset. And for whatever reason, even though the 802.11 standard specify some really good power save mechanisms, Intel decided to come up with their own. Yes, they did. Um, and what they were going to do was, what um, people who know about, about protocols, is there something called a duration ID in fields. It says how long I want the medium for, and it basically shuts other stations up. What Intel decided, a really good way to protect their 802.11 n transmission was in the RTS CTS, just do a really big duration ID. Look what the expert view in OmniPeak thought it was, wireless duration attack. Because it basically is. It is saying, shut up for a really long time. You're meant to do it for how long it's going to take you to transmit your frame. Look how long it was going to take to transmit the frame and get an act back. What the, the, well, the data frame was. So look at the... They, but what they do is they set a very, very large duration field to shut everyone up. RTX, CTS, then the encrypted frame, then the acknowledgement, and then the CFN frame. Does anyone know what the job of a CFN frame is? It's got a very special job. It sets the, your NAV, your network allocation factor, which is what you count down and assume the medium's busy for. It's what the duration ID, it sets it to zero. It's the only frame that can reset your NAV. The rules for having your network allocation factor is when you see a duration I value greater than your current NAV value, you update your NAV, but if it's lower, you keep it the same. So they use the CFN frame to basically reset everyone's NAV, otherwise no one would ever get a chance to transmit. And that's exactly what they were doing. So they've come up with their own proprietary 
protection mechanism. And I was just like, why? But it's what vendors do. You will see stuff like that. Um, and, and you need to be able to look at it and work out what's going on and understand it. Um, and yeah, and understand that it is a wireless generation attack, but it, it's actually not an attack. It's just how the Intel card is working and doing protection mechanism. Um, I, I hope people found that as exciting as I did. Um, <laughs> Maybe not quite as exciting as I found it, but um, so packets gives you a wealth of information. Um, I always say to people, prove it with a capture. So do you, you, you've been at this conference. Sometimes when you, when you meet other wireless and professionals in the bar in an evening, you can get into a heated debate about how something actually works, or maybe on Twitter. You're having a heated debate about how something works, or in a forum. And you know what's like, everyone's saying, well, it works like this, I don't think it works like this. Do you know what I always say? Set it up in a lab, do a packet capture, prove your point. Always, always, you can prove it with a packet capture. The packets don't lie. Yes, Blake. Where would you recommend, where, where do you recommend capturing from? from the client, from the access point, and then how do you correlate the two together when you're doing your decodes? It's a great question. Um, I recommend capturing from the client, I'll just be honest. Um, and I don't often capture from the AP because I believe you can see everything you need to from the client. It, there's a problem, who's experiencing it? It's a client, isn't it? If, um, it, 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 if, so I want to see what the client is experiencing. Now, I had this um, just at the Wi-Fi track conference this year in New Orleans. I actually presented on this um, topic. Um, and I, I said, let's say you set up an, an example to catch power mismatch. Everyone talks about, you know, does power mismatch really happen and, and how does it work? And you might go, well, we're going to set up, we're going to have an, a, we've got an AP on louder power than a client. So we're going to like do an experiment to capture it and see if we can actually monitor it. So we're going to put an analyzer near the client and we're going to put one near the AP. So you do that and these are your results. Okay, On the client, it sees the AP's packets and you see it return packets. So on the capture near the client, you see both direction communication. You go to the AP and you see the AP communication, you don't see the client. Is there a problem? Exactly. If the AP can decode the packets, no. Your analyzer, Nick Card, can decode those packets and is not seeing the packets, but it's not the AP. If the AP wasn't getting the client's packets, what would I see on the client? No, no acknowledgements, I'd see retransmissions. So actually the client tells me everything I need to know. The AP capture, I'm seeing what my laptop sees in the location of the AP. If there's multiple clients complaining, I personally still start at the client. I want to observe the problem. Now, sometimes I then go near to an AP or something, but I want to see the problem from a client point of view. Sometimes you do have to go near the AP. It, the, 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 the exception to these rules is if you, um, if you think it's affecting all the clients um, and, and from the client all you're seeing is you, you, it's sending packets to the AP but it's not getting any responses, I then might go and say, well, what is it like from the AP's point of view? And it might actually be I want to do spectrum analysis near the AP because it's an interference source near the AP that I'm not picking up near the client. But, but, it, but I nearly always start at the client. Because I'm looking at it from their point of view. They're the people having a problem, not the AP necessarily. Could be the AP having a problem, but I'll see an effect of that at the client. I hope that answers that question. Um, so prove it with um, packets that don't lie. Um, one, I've added a couple of extra slides um, into this slide deck based upon um, a few conversations that I had this week um, and I, I thought might be helpful to um, talk about. Um, and that is the presence of no data. Um, this was a capture someone actually sent me um, via Twitter who was having trouble. They said they've seen sort of RTS, CTS storms in their packet captures. Um, and they sent me this. It's packet capture. And 
you see RTS-C, TS block ACK, RTS-C, TS block ACK, in case it's a bit small at the back. RTS-C, TS block ACK, RTS-C, TS block ACK. Um, I opened the capture up, I saw it, I shut it down, I emailed him his reply of what was going on. What's going on? He was capturing, this is a really classic example, you see it a lot, that's why I instantly knew what the problem was. He was capturing with a NIC card that didn't support the file rate he was sending data at. So he's capturing with a single, trying to capture, say, three spatial stream traffic with a two spatial stream card. And the traffic's going at three spatial streams, you can't capture it. But obviously the control and management frames often go to lower data rates, so you can see those. Obviously RTS, CTS is to reserve the medium of the lower data rate traffic. So really what we've got is in this trace file, we have got missing data, um, which you can see at that point there, after the CTS, we've got missing data. Now, just because the data's missing doesn't mean I don't know it was, wasn't transmitted successfully because I'm seeing an acknowledgement. I'm also, if I look at the duration time, this is the time between packets, you can see the higher duration time before the block act, given the presence that something's happened in that time, that was where my data happened. I couldn't capture it, but I can see it, and you can see the presence of it. You could almost, refer not too much, but you could refer something from the length of that duration value to the length of the packet that was transmitted. Um, and if that was encrypted data, do I really need it? You don't always need to capture the data. I want to, um, and another example, a question I get asked a lot, so I thought I'd put another slide upon it, was multi-user MIMA, capturing multi-user MIMA and analyzing it, because we can't, from at least a mobile an analysis point of view, we can't capture multi-user MIMA frames. You'd have to be at all three locations. Let's say you had three clients, which is the example in the slide. You'd have to be at all locations to capture it because um, the only way you can capture multi-user MIMO is from the AP transmitting the multi-user MIMO frame if it's able to give you it over the wire, okay? Which um, it would be the only way. I'll, I'll give you the three separate frames because that's what it's doing. It's sending three separate frames at the same time. But let's have a look at what we can capture so this is, there was three multi-user MIMO clients in this um, trace file um, and one AP. I'll just talk you through some of the things that's happening. This first little section that we've got here um, is um, what we'd call the multi-user MIMO sounding exchange. It's setting up um, the ability to send multi-user MIMO frames to these three clients. Um, that you, you'll, the only difference you'll see is if you look at the things in some of the books that explained its process, there's actually a null data packet that gets transmitted, um, and that actually gets transmitted here, okay, um, after the first NDP announcement. And that's missing because we don't capture null data frames because they're just a physical layer header with no data. That's what a null data frame is. So there's no MAC layer data to capture. There's no MAC header or anything to capture. So we don't see that, but we know it's there. And then you see basically the beam forming Perl reports coming back from each client. Um, and you, I've labeled them clients one, two, and three. Um, and then we get basically the acknowledgement of data coming back from each client. We get a block act from client three, then one, then two in its first thing. They all, and we get block act requests. So they all acknowledge the receipt of some data. So again, I have missing data. It is at this point my multi-user data was transmitted. I can capture it, but I know it's there. And again, I can look at the delta time and see that my delta time is bigger. Following every thing, I see my delta time being a bit bigger. So there's a clear to sender, and then I see, which is a CTS to self, um, and then I see a bigger duration ID before um, all my acknowledgements. So sometimes when you're troubleshooting Wi-Fi problems, we don't need to get the data to know the data existed. What we're looking at is we're looking at the wireless environment, aren't we, when we're troubleshooting wireless? And I don't think there's a lot of people worrying about how can we capture the data. Do you always need the data? I would say for a lot of the troubleshooting I do, I don't actually need the data because it's encrypted. And if I want the data and it's an application layer problem, I'm capturing, I normally have to capture on the wide network anyway. And I'll capture traffic coming from behind the wireless control or behind the AP. I, I personally nearly always take a wide capture when I take a wireless capture as well if I can. Um, so I can get my data, because if it's not a Wi-Fi issue, it might be an application layer issue, and therefore you need your wired analysis as well. So that was just a little thought on multi-user MIMO I wanted to mention. Um, 
I thought it'd be useful to mention at the same time as well. Um, I'll take questions, if there's any. So, uh, what's your approach to, to something that you cannot reproduce, and interim errors that happen every now and then, or never, where you really want them? Okay, so, yeah, you get, you get them a lot. You get times when there's issues which, you, you, an issue's occurred, I go on site, and of course everything works perfectly. I actually had that um, literally the day before I flew out, and I, I'm going back to the site next week. Um, and... They were having problems, um, and what they forgot to tell me was these problems occur in the morning, and I was going in the afternoon. So that slightly annoyed me. Um, sometimes I'll leave capture devices on site. Um, so th there's various ways you can do that, but very often I'll leave something. I'll either leave something capturing all the time, or I'll say, I'll leave it set up so it's literally a button click for someone to capture the packets when the problem occurs, um, if I can do that. I I'll try and though, understand as much as I can about it, because even... Um, though I didn't see the problem at this site, I think I'm 90% sure what the problem was. From I did, I did, I, I, I monitored the airspace. I looked at the wireless install. I did actually a, a site survey. Um, so I've got a good understanding of the wireless environment, and, and I know there's problems with the design at that site. Um, and the problems with design at that site are in the areas where the problems were occurring. Now I haven't proved it because I've not seen the problem yet. Um, but I, I, I've got some good indicators, and I, yeah, it, it's difficult when the problem is randomly occurring. You have to generally leave something capturing um, or, or some sort of device doing it. We, I, we, I have, um, I'm quite lucky, I've got a lot of capture tools. I have some long-term packet storage devices which are capable of, like, capturing for several days. I can leave something capturing a week if I need to. And I just make sure that, when the, I always say when the problem occurs, make sure you know down the times of when it happened and the device is involved, and I can go back and pull out the relevant packets. And that's what I tend to do. Any more questions? The answer's no. <laughs> <laughs> is there any problem that stumped the great Peter McKenzie that you weren't able to fix with your protocol analyzer? I feel horrible saying this, but no. <laughs> um, and, and actually, it, it's got to a point now where um, uh, there's a, a sales guy who works at, in my company literally promises customers I will fix their problem for them um, and, and offers them them and says they don't need to pay for the consultancy for it if I don't fix it, um, which puts a little bit of pressure on me. Um, but, but I've so far not come across a problem I've not been able to fix. In fact, to close it, if I can't, can't see a problem, it's very hard to fix. But generally, if I can observe it, see it happening, I can generally... When I say fix, I can say why it's happening. Sometimes it's not actually me who does the fixing. For example, I told you about um, the, the one with the router at the, at the travel agents. I said, you, I'm seeing this much traffic going in, it's not coming out either side, you've got an issue with the router. The guy who managed the router logged on and went, Oh, yeah, there's some band limiting on. So technically, he clicked the box that fixed the problem. I just pointed them in the right direction. But yeah, generally, I've so far been able to fix problems I've seen. Any other questions? Question at the front. Uh, have you ever faced or been... Uh or observe problems with the very new protocols like 11K and 11V because they're, they're brand new on the infrastructure side and brand new on the client yeah. side. So. Um, at times when protocols are new, that's often where you find problems with them. And, and a lot of the problems I discover actually are, are normally chipset problems or driver problems or the particular firmware has got a little bug in it and it's not actually operating as it should. Uh, um, so I do see that. I'm, I'm very keen when new protocols come out, I try and get a capture off it and set up in my lab because I like to see it. And so what I was saying by learn from protocols, when 11R came out, and I, I even wrote a blog on it, because I think 11R is really cool, um, I, I, I set it up in a lab, and I did some captures, because I, I wanted to know how it works, so mm. that if I come across it in the field, or it's not working as it should, I can, I can spot that. But mm -hmm. yeah, I would say numerous times, and when protocols are new, that's normally when they cause problems. 
But, um, but you need to build up experience before you face the first problem, isn't it? Yeah, you need to be capturing. I, 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 when I first started getting into Wi-Fi capture, I used to capture everywhere I went. I sat, you know, you get to an airport. I wasn't taking my laptop out to um, get on the free Wi-Fi and sniff. I was sniffing the packets. Mm -hmm. um, I used to sniff packets everywhere I went. I don't do it as much now, but I, I, I did that just to, to learn. What was going on? I used to sniff packets, see what I could see. I used to select this protocol, have a look at it, select another protocol. I just used to love looking at data everywhere I go. Um, and, and, and that's how I learned. Just, just yeah, there's, there's Wi-Fi everywhere nowadays. It's even easier. You know, you can do it in a hotel room. Do some packet captures, have a look what's going on. See what you can see. Uh, I'd really, really recommend it. Now, maybe, maybe don't look what next door, yeah. Now you, also, <laughs> now you also have a remote sensor that you can put somewhere else and watch what's happening there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. much.